удалось увеличивать количество слушателей в среднем раза два, в два раза в год. И в этом году на конференции в Вашингтоне студенты за свободу было уже более тысячи человек. И это очень важно, что молодежь заинтересована в идеях свободы и помогает нам их распространять. Надеюсь, что нам тоже здесь удастся продвигать эти идеи. Постепенно чтения Адама Смита растут. Вот вы можете видеть в расписании, что после трех часов дня наши лекторы уже не поместятся в этом зале и параллельно будет идти сессия на третьем этаже. Кроме того, в течение года нам удавалось кроме чтения Адама Смита, активнее проводить форумы свободных людей, то есть конференции не только в Москве, но и в других регионах России. Я думаю, что если мы хорошо потрудимся сегодня, то эта тенденция будет продолжаться, поэтому хочу пожелать всем успешной работы и лекторам, и слушателям, и журналистам, и ведущим дискуссии и тем, кто, может быть, например, ведет твиттер трансляции сегодняшнего заседания. Успехов всем нам, спасибо. И я предоставляю слово доктору Больгену Йону, руководителю московского филиала фонда Фридрика фон Наумана. Да, спасибо. Уважаемые дамы и господа, от имени фонда Фридриха Наумана «За свободу» я хотел бы тоже вас сердечно приветствовать на чтение Адама Смита. Наш фонд выступает в Германии и в больше 60 стран мира за экономическую свободу и право на частную собственность. Поэтому мы сегодня поддерживаем с большим удовольствием ваше мероприятие. Адам Смит читал э, лекции по риторике, по искусству написания писем и позднее по предмету достижения богатства, где он впервые детально изложил экономическую философию. Как он сказал, очевидные и простой системы природной свободы. Для существования естественного порядка требуется по смету система естественной свободы, основу которой он видел в частной собственности. Все это нашло отражение в его самой известной работе «Исследование о природе и причинах богатства народа в 1776 году». Книга в деталях описывает последствия экономической свободы. В книгу включены обсуждения таких концепций, как лезосфер, принцип невмешательства, роль эгоизма, разделение труда, функции рынка и международное значение свободной экономии. Богатство народов открыло экономику как науку, запустив доктрину свободного предпринимательства. Сегодня теория Смита очень актуальна. Узкоспециализированная экономия э, э, базируется на международном обмене, трансфере товаров, э, рабочей силы и ноу-хау. Особое значение э, при этом имеет доверие, которое возможно только при условии соблюдения прав предпринимателей, независимости судов и невмешательства государства в экономику. Одним словом, бизнес-отношения строятся сегодня на доверии, которое создается посредством общих политически гарантированных, гарантированных государств условий для экономики. И именно... Э, Экономическая динамика 
našemu vremeni pozvoljajo nam snova i snova prijateljivati tijen prošlova v naših odnošenjah. V njih pa stoji vremenja poslije palših izmenjenji 90-ih jakov ekonomički interesi in uski ekonomički mešpotrasljive svjazi in pomaklina prijateljeti konflikti in najti kompromise. Eto kasajec za odnošenja mešču Rasiji in Germaniji v tojši stepeni, kak odnošenja mešču Rasiji in Evropejskom sajuzu. Mesto halotnoj vladni mešču našimi gospodarstvami suštvuje cilodnja očin tesnoje ekonomičskoje satrudničstvo. Naši savmestni protivniki cilodnja ne gospodarstva, a prepjatstvija dve razvitja mešnarodnega razstrenjenja truda. Vso je še široko razprostanjenje neuvaženih častne sobstvenosti sa stvarni gospodarstv. Nacionalizem in izolacionalizem v raznih častih vira. Protekcionizem slušaši predeljovnim kratkosročnim interesam predeljovnih grupirov. A takšne mnogočiselne papitke gospodarstvenega planirovanja in regulirovanja, katori bi tudi političnim rešenjam tam, kdje sravodali bi zakona, zakon in rinka. Nam ni nužno prihladivati na naših tedje in vnukov kruz advjetstvenosti v formi dalgov. Budušemu pokalenju nužni konkretni rešenja za advjetstvojiše trebovanja rinka. Dami gospoda, v etnim kontekstu ja želaju vam uspešnjo pravedenja v etnodo sasedanje. Spasibo. Vstopitelnim slovom vstopit Sergej Zojev, rektor Moskovske vyššej školy socialnych a ekonomičskih nauk pri Rosijskej akademiji narodnoho hazajstva i gospodarstvene služby. Uvažajme kolegi, dragi gosti, ja rad prijestovat vas zdiš ljudi, ktorje utrom subotu рискнули расширить сферу своего ученого незнания, выражаясь голодом с желанием Николая Каузанского. Московская высшая школа социально-экономических наук, как Российско-Британский университет Магистерский, конечно же, не могла упустить возможности, имея свои отношения с Манчестером, с английским университетом, провести чтение имени Великого Шотландца. Мы, конечно, понимаем всю остроту проблемы в глобальном масштабе, которая будет обсуждаться на этих чтениях, но при этом, конечно, преследуем свои цели, имея в виду отношения разного рода университетов на великой территории Китая. В принципе, я не планировал говорить о таких содержательных тезисах в нашем утреннем вступительном слове, Это понятно, суббота, утро, окраина Москвы и другие сложности, которые нас окружают в этом мире. Я могу вспомнить только урок, который провел у меня один мой друг, объяснить мне, что такое настоящая политика и что такое настоящая столкновение мира. Вообще-то говоря, этот мой друг, он человек из Амисла, он реставратор икон. И когда-то, когда я был у него в мастерской и вот сказал ему, что мне приходится заниматься какими-то политическими вопросами, в том числе там, работать с партиями, обсуждать столкновение людей и прочее, и прочее, он сказал мне, да не пожалуйста, ко мне вот сюда, к моему рабочему столу. И я подошел, он показал мне доску, на которой была нарисована икона, он сказал, обратите внимание, на этой доске три слова. Значит, слой первый – это слой XIV века, самый древний и тем ценный. Слой второй – это слой, нарисованный ну, в период Лужа Дмитриев и очень интересен просто своим историческим контекстом. 
А слой третий, самый верхний, который мы видим, это слой, ну, в общем, принадлежащий кисти одного очень известного иконописца и ценен тем, что принадлежит вот этому конкретному иконописцу. И он мне сказал, ты представляешь, мне надо реставрировать эту икону, я могу отреставрировать только один слой. Проблема в том, что два других пропадут. Вот он сказал. И что мне выбрать? Я не знаю. Заказчик тоже не знает. И совершенно очевидно, что у каждого слоя найдется группа людей, которые с полным правом на истину своего утверждения будут говорить, что надо восстанавливать именно этот слой. С одной стороны, любое решение будет неправильным, с другой стороны, не принимать решение невозможно, потому что иначе разрушится под основой и, вот, в общем, какие-то там технологические проблемы, которые характерны для этой школы и комплекса. А вот здесь, сказал он мне, начинается политика. Когда любое решение будет неправильным, когда расширяется сфера нашего ученого незнания, когда мы точно понимаем, даже самое дорогое нам решение приведет к исчезновению вариантов, которые могли э, быть тоже э, правильными и хорошими перспективами. Вот он меня тогда этому научил, этот иконописец. И я с тех пор, когда принимаю участие в обсуждениях такого рода, все время вспоминаю этот замечательный урок и просто хотел с вами поделиться своим опытом на эту тему и пожелать вам успешного обсуждения вопросов, которые стоят в программе сегодняшней конференции. Удачи вам, уважаемые коллеги. И мы приступаем уже непосредственно к работе. Открывается секция «Нравственные чувства», и я хочу вам представить Модератора этой секции Вадима Новикова, Российская Академия Народного Хозяйства и Государственной Службы при Президенте Российской Федерации. Сейчас он представит наших участников панельной дискуссии. Проблемы. 
На самом деле проблем, на самом деле даже многие сторонники капитализма считают на самом деле, что капитализм плохо влияет на пора. Многие экономисты, поддерживающие свободный рынок, говорят, что капитализм эффективен, он способствует нашему богатству, но тем не менее есть и какие-то моральные проблемы, которыми можно пренебречь. А задача, нашей внутренней, а задача нашей внутренней дискуссии – послушать, поспорить на эту тему, насколько капитализм мораль. А каждый из сегодняшних, у каждого из сегодняшних докладчиков будет в распоряжении 40 минут на разговор, вопросы и ответы. А после первых двух выступлений мы сделаем короткий 10-минутный перерыв. Итак, я, принципе, я приглашаю присоединиться ко мне Дмитрию Маковске, Жидара Маринова, Тома Палмера и Максима Тодорева.
cheap on Amazon.com. <laughs> Buy the book. Urge it to be translated into Russian. Um, I argue in this book, which was published in 2006, that a good person and a, and a good society must have in action seven virtues. From these seven principal virtues, you can derive as though mathematically other virtues, piety and so forth. And those virtues are, as I said, prudence, justice, courage, and temperance, or, or, or self-command, as Adam Smith or uh, said. Those four are called in the ancient world, in the ancient, among the Greeks and the Romans, were called the cardinal virtues. The word cardinal comes from the Latin for hinge and door. Hinge and door. And it, it's the four virtues. They're, they're, they're also called the pagan virtues. <coughs> pagan virtues. At least they're called that by Christians. Those four. Here, here them again. In fact, I'll draw a diagram. I'll draw a diagram. Watch, we're, we're going to draw that. Here's prudence, right? It's at the bottom. We're going to put prudence there. Um, prudence is the virtue of know how, savoir faire, phronesis, as it was called in Greek. Practical wisdom. Knowing how to do things is prudence. We teach our children and our dogs to look both ways when crossing the street, most especially in these very broad streets in Moscow. Look both ways. Prudence. So that's prudence. It's also, you could call it self-interest. And if all you have is prudence, only prudence, then that's greed. Okay, so there's prudence. P, we'll call it. P, R, as in, as in uh, okay, P. Okay, P. Then up here, there's courage. Now, courage is a virtue we all need. The obvious case is battlefield courage. I just read for the first time War and Peace by, by, by Tolstoy. It's a wonderful book. I had a supervisor in graduate school named Alexander Gershon Krom. Russian from Odessa. And he told me that he had read War and Peace six times. <laughs> six times he had read War and Peace. And four of the times were repeats. That is, he would come to the end of the novel and have to, he couldn't bear to leave it. So he started over again with the famous opening slur I had. In any case, courage, battlefield courage, is the obvious part. But in war and peace, there's courage of other kinds, too. The, um, the, the, the courage that's involved in all our lives. If everyone in this room is showing courage right now, by coming to this 
coming to this discussion. Because your government right now does not approve of you. You are not followers of Putin. I don't believe there are any followers of Putin unless there are secret police here which I say, hi, how are you? Maybe you better not cancel. All right, so there's prudence and courage. You know, um, there's a f famous Russian novel, Oblomov, yeah? Where the man hasn't got the courage to get out of bed in the morning. So he stays in bed. He decides to stay in bed for the rest of his life. Sounds very nice. <coughs> yeah. that's, that's a lack of courage to face the bed. So it's a very ordinary approach. It's not only in the battle against Napoleon that you show your courage, but in your life, courage. Then there's, there's temperance, which will be okay. the prudence, observe what is prudence, courage. Here is temperance, or as Adam Smith said, I mean, every time I mention Adam Smith, I have to cross myself, and since I'm here, I've got to cross myself both ways. Um, he calls it self-command. And, and temperance is the virtue of resisting pleasurable desire. I've just lost, in the last five months, 12 kilos. Nice, huh? I plan to lose still more. This I did, by the way, in case you want to know how to do it, by doing what my mother told me to do at age three. Eat your vegetables. <coughs> Eat fruits and vegetables and you lose weight. That's the prudence part of it. The knowledge, right? That's the knowledge of how to do it. But the temperance is necessary to, to control your desire to eat ice cream in Moscow. Ice cream in Moscow is very, very good. This is going to be a real problem for me. You have the best ice cream in the world. So, I'm a, fortunately, I'm only going to be here until Monday. So there's a chance that I'll get back to Chicago without gaining 12 kilos. That's good. So there's prudence, temperance, courage. And then there's justice. Temperance is balance inside the soul, inside the individual, right? The balance, you don't eat too much ice cream, you don't um, indulge yourself <coughs> in sex too much, enough, enough, not too much. Courage is control of fear, temperance is control of impulse. Impulse control is something that young people need to work on, particularly young men. This is the big task for a young person, is impulse control. That's, that's the temperance, courage. Courage they often have in abundance. That's why, since they don't have much, these young men don't have much impulse control, but have a lot of control over fear, they then make excellent soldiers. But there's, there's justice, which is balance in the society, or in the family, or among friends, or in the office, or in the, uh, um, or in the factory. Justice in a 
its simplest definition is treating other people as they should be treated. Observe that the other three of these cardinal or pagan virtues are about how you treat yourself more than anything else. Ethics is not just about how you treat other people. It's also about how you treat yourself. Now, I'm a, I'm a Christian, I'm an Anglican, so I believe that there's a theological grounding to all this, but you don't be concerned if you're not, which is that you're one of God's creatures too. So how you treat yourself is as much a question of ethics as how you treat other people. But the treating of other people is justice. So prudence, temperance, courage, and, and justice. Then there are three more. Three more, these three more are called the theological virtues are the Christian virtues. Alas, they're not called the Christian virtues because Christians show them. <laughs> I don't think the, uh, I don't think the, the Orthodox Church has embodied in what is now called, I'm told, by English tourists, the Pussy Riot Church which I think is a wonderful, just outcome. Uh, I don't think they were exercising these Christian virtues when they prosecuted these rock musicians. Okay, those three virtues are faith, hope, and love. In, in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13, St. Paul says, faith, hope, and love, these three abide or survive. The greatest of these is love. <coughs> now, hope is a very entrepreneurial virtue. It's the virtue of having a project. It's a forward-looking <coughs> virtue. We here in this room have the project of the birth of freedom in Russia. And that's a noble, meaningful project. It may be, certainly, for most of us, it's not the only project we have in our lives. I have the project of trying to get this book translated into Russian, as I said. I have the project of finishing volume three of the, of the two, one, two, three. And then I'll have a box set. You know, three volumes in a box, like Harry Potter, and I will die happy. Box set. Is there anything cooler than a box set? I mean, how cool is that? Wow. So having a project is hope. And, and you'll notice that the other four virtues, these pagan virtues, have no purpose, no object. No meaning unless you have hope. I mean, why would you be prudent <coughs> or just <coughs> or temperate <coughs> or courageous unless there was some higher goal? So my higher goal is God. Well, 
It doesn't have to be that. It can be the Libertarian Party. Or it can be Adam Smith. <laughs> or it can be the family. Or science. Or scholarship. Or, uh, I don't know the name of the main Moscow football team. Well, whatever that is. As against those terrible people from, from Petersburg. Okay? So hope supplies a meaning to the other virtues. So here we have it. Prudence, temperance, courage, justice, hope up here. Then there's faith. Now faith could mean believing in God or going to church or to, uh, <coughs> to your tomb, temple or whatever. But it also means identity. Who you are. If hope is where you are going, in Latin, quo vadis, where do you go? Quo vadis. Faith is where you come from. Who you are. You're a Russian. You're a woman. You're a libertarian. You're a student, you're a daughter, you're a friend, you're a scholar, you're an entrepreneur, you're an employee, you're a this, you're a that. So having an identity is as important in giving meaning to the four we could call them off of the, these pagan virtues, you could call instrumental. Useful virtues. But useful for what? We, 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 we say in English, adopting Yiddish, we say, so what else is new? So, in French, hello. Yiddish again, or uh, new in Dutch, and so what? Right? So what? And faith provides you with an answer to the so what. Now, as economists, we tend to ignore the so what, the meaning. In fact, economics is a science in the modern world, particularly Samuel Sonian economics, or for that matter, Marxist, some kinds of Marxist economics, ignore the so what. They ignore the new, the meaning, the ultimate purpose. You could call it, if you wanted to be theological, I hope it's easy to translate in, into Russian, you need a transcendent transcendent, something above, right? So we have hope and faith. Faith is where you come from. Hope is where you're going to. And love, love is the spring of it all. It was, it was, it was a very strange um, turn in thought when the Christians, specifically the Christians, said that God is love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, is how we say it in Christianity. This, this love business didn't, you know, friendship, filia, was a virtue in the ancient world. But it was, not it was not the purpose, it was not transcendent love. 
the Greeks called it agape. They, they have, I wonder how it is in Russian, but in most modern languages, there's only one word for love. In French, or German, or English, it's love. And there you are, love. Liebe. Yeah, that's it. Whereas in Greek, they had three words for love. Eros, you young people know all about that. Eros. And, 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 and filia, which is friendship. And then this third thing, agape, agape. God's love for his creations, actually, I think he's a her, by the way. I think he's a black woman, but that, that's a separate matter. Let's call it he for now. He has love for us, and our love for the transcendent purposes represented in Christianity and Islam and Judaism and Buddhism and so forth by this God idea. We have an attraction for, a love for. It's not quite the same thing as hope. In a way, it gives hope its, its meaning. Because if you, you simply hope for the success of the Moscow football team, then your, your wife might ask, or your little girlfriend might ask, why? <laughs> why do you care for the success of the Moscow football team? I suppose Moscow has lots of football teams. You choose your favorite. So those are the seven virtues. Now this, this system of virtues was the way people thought about ethics until the 18th century. Indeed, until the late 18th century. Adam Smith, this is getting quite tiresome. I'll say A.S. from now on so that I don't have to cross myself every time. A.S., our man here, said, well, thought in the same way. He thought of goodness and badness being about virtues and about particular virtues, the four cardinal virtues plus love. So he had prudence, temperance, courage, and love. Courage, justice, and love. He, he didn't have faith and hope because he was a, a secular guy and uh, he didn't want to talk about what the, what the priests and the, and the ministers were talking about. Although he had friends who were Presbyterians and Anglicans. And he was not, you know, he didn't hate religious ideas, but he, like his friend Hume, David Hume, he would prefer not to have anything to, to do with us. But in fact, Adam Smith in his life did exhibit hope and faith. His hope, I claim, was to, I say, was to build an ethic for a society of merchants and manufacturers and actors in the marketplace. I don't like the word capitalism. The main reason I don't like it is that it draws attention to the wrong thing, namely the accumulation of capital. That's how it was first coined in its modern sense by uh, Karl Marx, and it's, it's a mistake. It, it, Adam Smith, the last, felt the same way about capitalism. He thought that ca capitalism must be about the accumulation of capital. So that, that leads me to my second book of the three, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This book is called, what is it called, Bourgeois Dignity. Why Economics Can't Explain the Modern World. Now, I'm an economist. I'm an economist right 
down to my shoes. I'm an economic engineer. I was trained as an economist. Not communist, economist. There's a joke there about Castro, but I want to uh, tell it. So I think that economics is a very useful way of looking at the world. In fact, in terms of our virtues, right? Economics is the pure theory of prudence. Prudence. Economics is the virtue of prudence theorized. The virtue of self-warfare. The virtue of know-how. The virtue of knowing how to maximize your profit, your utility, anything else you want to maximize, I can tell you how. <laughs> if I knew, I'd be rich, but still, I can, I can tell you how. So that's economics. And that's the problem. Because, because the modern world is very strange. One thing that's strange about it is that here we are, the ancestors, if not the ancestors, the descendants, the great, great, great grandchildren of peasants. I look around, I don't see any descendants of the crowned heads of Europe. I don't see any Habsburg chins. No. I think all of us are descended from serfs or other very poor people. In my case, you go back a few generations and you have very poor Irish and Norwegian peasants. You go back a little bit further, they're even poorer. And they get poor, they're very, very poor. How poor? Three dollars a day. Three American dollars. Three modern American dollars per day. Now, you may think things are tough in Moscow. And they are. They're not as good as they are in Chicago, but they're quite good by comparison with what they were in 1989. And much better than what they were in 19, um, 1900. And very much better than they were in 1800. 1800. Russian income per head was on the order of $2 a day. Now, and in the world as a whole in 1800, the world average was something like $3 a day. $3 a day. What could you buy in Moscow now with $3 a day? Well, you could buy a cappuccino. Maybe. No. No? Okay. Half a cup of cheese. Half a cup of cheese. And that's it. No more food. No shelter. You have to sleep outside. No clothing. <coughs> no education. No cameras. No watches. No books. Three dollars a day. Whereas now in Russia, that's income per head is roughly $40 a day. That is, you've gone from, from two or three dollars a day to 40, conservatively measured. You have 20 times more than your ancestors did. More goods and services. Now, if all you had was more goods and services, that would be nice. I guess that's better than having many fewer goods and services. But if you had lost your immortal soul, if capitalism, I'll have to use that word, was corrupting, then I wouldn't care. If all you got for more income was more Coca-Cola or more Marlboro cigarettes <coughs> or more pornography, <coughs> I wouldn't be interested in it. And I would say to you, 
you shouldn't be interested either. More pornography is not a, a better life. Although, by the way, I'm in favor of free, free the, the state not intervening in pornography. And indeed, this first book of my three asks, can you be an ethical person and still participate in the society of innovation and markets? And I can sort of save you, what is it, 606 pages by saying the, the answer is yes. So that's the uh, executive summary of the executive summary. Yes. But back then to bourgeois. <laughs> so, so, so here's my claim. My completely uncontroversial claim is that we're much richer than our ancestors. It's also not controversial to say that this is unique to the modern world. No other period, not the glory that was Greece or the grandeur that was Rome, not the Song dynasty in China, not Florence in the 15th century, not any society before has come close to enriching people as our society has. As this society that gets going in a serious way around 1800. It starts in Northwestern Europe, in Holland, and England, as my colleague here is going to point out. It starts there and spreads. But I'm also claiming, and this is controversial, perhaps not as controversial here as in some parts of the world, I'm claiming that the enrichment did not kill our spirit. The very engaging story of the icon, the three layers of the icon, is very much to the point here. Because the underlying layers of the icon in Russia are the old believers, the devotion to the Tsar, the hierarchical society, which began to uh, come apart in, in 1905 in Russia. And if you believed that capitalism was corrupted, if you believe that capitalism is about greed is good, I'm saying no, it's not. It's about an ethical capitalism. Then you would say, well, maybe it's better to go back to the first layer, the icon. Or maybe even the second level, since it's an icon, maybe all three. But I'm saying no. And this meeting is an example. You people are rich enough. She's playing with her uh, phone right now, which wouldn't this, this, this woman here is playing with the phone. And that's possible. She now has a gun she's playing with the phone. Um, that, that's something that her ancestors didn't have access to. They couldn't go to, the, go to the, look at the news or something. But that she's here at all, excuse me if I use you as an example, is an example of the spiritual change since 1800. You could assemble an audience perhaps this large in 1800 in, in Russia to talk about the economic and social future. But they wouldn't be the descendants of peasants. <laughs> they would be rich people. <laughs> Well, not even very many of those. They would be mainly members of the nobility or the higher gentry. The 
the kind of people who Tolstoy was mainly, mainly talking about in War and Peace. So the question is, why did this amazing event happen? Why do we have this fantastically innovative society all around us? I mean, look around you. Reinforced concrete is my favorite example of this. Reinforced concrete takes a technology of Romans, namely um, cement, and adds cheap steel. Cheap steel was invented by an Englishman Henry Bessemer in 18, 1854, who thought it would be fun. He was a boy, you understand, he was a man. So he thought it would be fun to see what happened when you blew air through boiling iron. And in a boyish way, he was delighted when an enormous explosion happened. You know, he was a guy. So you uh, would like to see from the floor. And what you got is iron without carbon. The carbon was burned off. Then you'd add a controlled amount of carbon to the iron and you get steel. And you add the steel to concrete and you can build enormously tall new um, buildings. That's just one of the, of the fantastic innovations we can see right here. <coughs> this carpet you have. I mean, it's impossible to have made this carpet. It seems to be in a single sheet. Oh, no, wait, there's a, there's a uh, seam. A seam but the other seam is way over there, if it's over there at all. It's an enormous breadth of carpet. Cheap. Oh, not cheap. Uh, inexpensive. Very high quality. It's great. Uh, I wish people wouldn't give me more. Um, uh, take the water away. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, think of um, uh, uh, cloth. You know, my suit is inexpensive. Your, your watch on your on your uh, on your wrist. That, that costs very little to make in labor. How many, how many hours of work did it take you to buy your watch? Well, not very much by comparison with what a pocket watch cost in the 18th century. Before the 18th century, you didn't even have pocket watches. Um, medicine has improved gigantically since 1800. There is a wonderful um, show on the internet, it's only four minutes long, by a man named Rosling, R-O-S-L-I-N-G, Hans Rosling, R-O-S-L-I-N-G, which you should go see. Four minutes, he talks about economic development since 1800, the, in terms of income per head and life expectancy. And the whole world is moving up, not at the same rate, but even poor countries like India and China are really catching up. So why did it happen? Why did it happen? What I say in this book is that the usual ways of explaining it are wrong. The usual ways are materialist. In, in Marxist terms, for example, you exploit the working class, you take the surplus value from the working class, invest it in more capital, which generates more opportunities to exploit the working class, which generates more capital, etc., etc., etc. In English terms, M to C to M prime. That's Marx's famous equation. And that's nonsense. It doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is very simple. There's been capital accumulation since the caves. Capital accumulation is easy. Well, not easy, but it's there. The Great Wall of China, the pyramids, were accumulation. And even accumulation, as Monica and 
modern Samuelsonian economists say sit Samuelsonians, named after Paul Samuelson, the inventor of modern economics. Even the Samuelsonian economists, when they talk about human capital, are making the same mistake. After all, the Chinese had a great examination system in which it was possible, and sometimes happened, um, it, was, it, it was possible, and sometimes happened, that the son of a, of a peasant could rise to be the chief advisor to the emperor. So investment in human capital is not, not the, the reason for the modern world. Nor is in, in investment gotten from, from slavery, the slave trade. But that's not the modern world. Because, to express it economically, it's too big a change. If investment were routine before, as it was, if investment were common, it was common, right? If people invested even when they were very poor, as they did, invest in making an axe to chop down a tree and no stone, if they were doing that, um, that's investment, but it didn't make them rich the way the last two centuries have. So there's something peculiar about the causes of innovation. It's not accumulation. It's not exploitation. It's innovation. As the Austrian economists say, it's discovery. Then you have the question, why the discovery? My claim is that it was the unique rise or birth of liberty and dignity. And this is how it, this, what I'm saying, what my two books in volume three are saying, connects with your interests. It was the rise of liberty and dignity of ordinary people, us, the media, ordinary folk that caused innovation. When people could hope to exceed the prosperity of their parents, when they could open a business when they wanted without state or guild harassment, when they could try out food, try out ideas, then the modern world was born. So the argument is that before the 18th century, especially before the 19th century in Northwestern Europe, the state or the interests of the arist aristocracy or the church was preventing a natural creativity that ordinary people have. When, now it, it takes two things. Something we all agree on is it takes liberty. That's a legal condition. There has to be private uh, uh, property, as it said. You have to be able to use the private uh, uh, property. That's about the law. But there's also a sociological change. There has to be a change in the attitude towards entrepreneurs, towards innovation. And this, as I understand it, I've been in Russia now for a little over 24 hours. It's my first trip, as I mentioned. And so now I am an expert on Russia. So I know how to, I'm from the United States, and I'm here to solve your problem. I, 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 you know, 24 hours is a long time. Most of it I spent sleeping, I have to admit. But still, I was dreaming about the Russia, so I continued to think it through. And it seems to me that your problem is not so much on the legal side, but on the side, the sociological side, on the dignity of enterprise. <coughs> I mean, being free to steal from the state, <laughs> say, or to or to use the use the mafia.
mafia to enforce contracts is not the same thing as an ethically of uh, capitalism of the sort that I'm urging you to uh, preach for. Well, okay, so that's bourgeois virtues, bourgeois dignity. I'll conclude with volume three. Volume three is, uh, I'll have it drafted by Christmas, maybe by the Chinese New Year, but in any case soon, and it'll be out in about a year and a half perhaps from now. And it's called The Treasured Bourgeoisie. The Treasured Bourgeoisie. Middle class. And then the <coughs> subtitle is How Innovation Became Ethical. 1600 to 1848, and then Delphi. So up to 1848, the liberal position is the one that everyone, almost everyone in this room, except for the Secret Service guys, hold in, in their heart. And then after 1848 came the birth of, well, nationalism and socialism, and if you find those attractive, perhaps you'll like national socialism. Um, I, I'm claiming in volume three, well, I, I explore in volume three, say it that way, I explore in volume three why innovation became ethical. Why something that earlier was constrained denied and crushed, for the most part, came to be free. Why indeed hope and courage, those two characteristic entrepreneurial virtues, prudence, hope, and courage, entrepreneurial virtues, came to be valued so highly in a secular way. And my explanations are partly the rise of alternative churches, as we're going to discuss later. The printing press is a material but also spiritual change of the sort that you're going through now in the internet. The internet is the new birth of freedom in the world, the new birth of intellectual freedom. Because like the printing press in Europe in the late 16th century was uncontrolled. The revolts and the revolutions in Europe in the 16th and 17th and 18th century were also important. So there was a gradual breakdown of hierarchy, a gradual realization that ordinary people not just dukes and czars could be free and dignified. And that's what we're here for, to make the world, <coughs> Russia in particular, a place where ordinary people are free and dignified. Thank you very much. if you're doing it correctly. Because the bottom line is, if you have good judgment, if you're using the right style for the right moment, the people aren't gonna say, oh, you know, he did a great job here, but he mixed up the styles, and so I don't really trust him. No, you did a good job. If you're not using the right styles at the right moments, then you're definitely gonna have your credibility question. And you point it, you get it right at it here. Is because one of the things we like in characters, not just doing the right thing, not what's politically right, but in some respects we like constancy. We like people who are solid. You know, if the facts change from Monday to Wednesday, hopefully your behavior changes. You don't want to be too constant, otherwise you're just stubborn. But we don't want people flipping and flopping. And so if you're, if you're, 
you know, changing the way that you approach people all the time and it's not effective, then you're really not going to look like you're a constant person. You're really not going to have this strong character in front of the people. But if you're mixing these leadership styles up effectively, you have the right style for the right personnel, the right situation, the right circumstance, then you're going to increase your credibility. Yeah. Can I just comment on that? Of course. Yeah. Of course. Um, But sometimes within the crowd or the people that you are supposed to be their leader, there might just show up a certain person that somehow uh, has a personal interest or other interest just to make you not the leader anymore. And you know, I'm talking about a country level. Well, it happens all the time. Yeah, it happens. because we have this in Egypt and mm -hmm. it happens a lot. So I'm just talking from experience on things that really happen. And some people were just taken for granted to be the best people that could actually govern the, the country or to be ruling the country. And then there is a very, very strange you know, drift in the, in the direction of all the people that were just saying that this is a perfect leader for us. That's why I'm telling you that sometimes mixing this kind of leadership, you don't know the crowd very well, especially when you are talking about a national le level of leadership. Mm -hmm. So how are you going just to manage um, controlling all the crowd and being that credible and perfectly leading everything and just ready for all the circumstances and all the down drops that might happen? It, it's, I have the same response to you, which is people aren't saying, you know what? Barack Obama is being a democratic leader right now, or Barack Obama is being a coaching leader, or Barack Obama right now is being a coercive leader, or an authoritative leader, or a pace-saving leader. They're not thinking like that. They're thinking, is he getting the job done? That's the question. And so what I'm saying to you is, I understand there are different cultural expectations. I understand certain types of leadership styles are expected in certain cultures more than they are in others. What I'm saying is, is, just changing your style isn't necessarily going to undermine your credibility. It's if that style isn't working for you, because that's ultimately how you're going to be judged. It's a bottom line game. And quite frankly, you're going to be blamed for things that really aren't your fault. We talked about this in the first lecture. It's exogenous circumstances, things outside your control. You know, in the United States, it's, is the economy doing well at the time of the election? It's this pocketbook issue. You know, and the U.S. president doesn't really have a huge impact on that. He has an impact on it, but it, it can be other forces that are dictating this. Okay, I think we're out of time. Well, we have five minutes, and then we have ten minutes break, and then we start. Okay, okay. Okay, she hasn't spoken. Um, I'm Christina Bonfiglio. Um, I was wondering, sometimes you have leaders that focus on just um, being approved by uh, the people who they are leading, and they just forget about the end result. So I think, I just want to add on what you're saying, that I think uh, ineffective leaders are the ones that focus on making other people like them, yeah. and not actually to get the job done. Yeah, this was, this was my problem with affiliated leader, and I have an example of this in my life right now. It's weakness. You know, I think one of the best things about leadership